2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want to read one verse tonight. We preached last Thursday out of verse 3 and 4 on enduring hardness as a good soldier. And we talked about the life of a Christian in comparison to a soldier. And uh, the majority of that message is on YouTube. If you didn't get to hear that, go back and listen to it. And tonight we'll cover verse 5. And then, Lord willing, next Thursday we'll cover verse number 6. As Paul compares the life of a Christian to some very practical, tangible illustrations. If you're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 5, say amen. I'm going to let you remain seated. Uh, I would ask you to stand, but some of y'all look like you got one more stand up in you. And you're going to need that to get home. Amen? And so uh, Brother Taylor's getting me some water. I, uh, you know, I, I think those three pieces of chicken made me thirsty. I don't know. Could have been them two rolls or maybe that lemon cake. I don't know, but I need a little water. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Paul said, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Let's read it again. It's a short verse. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Father, give us clarity of thought tonight. May your word get in us as we get in your word. I pray for every person that is here, including myself, that we would receive a personal word from you. Something that applies to us that we can do tomorrow, tonight. We can do better. We can stop doing. Put your finger on something in my heart and in the heart of every person here. and Use this message to draw us into your presence and your likeness. I'll thank you for that and I'll praise you. And it is in Jesus' name, amen. Last week we looked at Paul comparing the life of a Christian to that of a soldier. Boy, I enjoyed that message last week. I want to talk out of verse 5, out of the truth that Paul is comparing the Christian to an athlete. To an athlete. How many of you used to be athletic. Let me see your hand. And now how many of you are just amazed that you can put your drawers on without falling over? Can I get an amen? I mean, that's an athletic endeavor. We're not going to put that on YouTube, but that's an athletic endeavor. I heard one guy say that I was cut out to be an athlete, but I got sewed up wrong. Can I get an amen right there? <laughs> you know, I, I thought about when I was younger, and probably all of us, you know, you'd do things, you'd play sports, you'd, you'd get knocked down, you'd get run over. We used to play basketball four quarters, you know, at full court, never come out of the game, and, uh, you know, take a quick shower and go out the rest of the night and just ride along with life. And now when I bend over to tie my shoes, I look around to see if there's anything else that needs to be done while I'm down there. Can I get an amen? Athleticism is often fleeting. But Paul does use that comparison. The term in verse number 5, to strive for masteries, is the Greek word athleo. And it is where we derive our English word for athlete. And that word athlete literally means to invest oneself into winning. To strive for masteries. It is not just to compete. It is not just to be on the roster. But this is someone who is seeking to win. Now I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thankful to be on the roster tonight. But I want to win in this call to Christianity. I don't want to just participate. I want to strive for mastery of my Christian life. So that word, athlete, is derived from that statement, to strive for masteries. In Paul's time, athletes were known 
for competing and training for what is now, in our understanding, very similar to the Olympic Games. And Paul is referencing that because culturally people understood that. They could see the visual of that. It was very prominent in their day. And as he makes this comparison, he says there are four elements in the life of the athlete that are compatible to the life of a Christian. Number one, write this down somewhere. Notice the element of the crowd. The element of the crowd. He says this in verse number five, If a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned. Now, these were public events, just as the Olympics now are televised and they are watched by millions around the world. In Paul's day, these events, these games, were attended by basically everyone that could watch, did watch. There was a crowd that was watching. And because of the crowd that is watching, listen to this, remember you write this down, their training was private, but their testing was public. They trained in private, but they were tested in public. These games were very similar to track and field events now. And they would train to run. They would train for shot put. They would train for the javelin. They would train for these things, but the training took place in private. And I want to say to you that there is a crowd that is watching our Christian life. There are people that are observing us in the arena of Christianity. They are watching us as we say that we serve God. How many of you know that there is a crowd watching us? There's a crowd watching you at work. There is a crowd watching you at school. There is a crowd in your neighborhood that is watching you. And I, I cannot tell you the times just this week where I have met people and come to find out that they know a whole lot more about me then I, I didn't even know who they were. But they watch our lives. And you don't know, even in your daily life, how you are being viewed by people who are spectators observing your walk with God. And you may not even know that they know you're a Christian, but publicly our lives are on display. We ought to remember that. The crowd is watching as they are tested publicly. But somebody help me right here. Their performance publicly is developed privately. The first time they ran the 800 meters was not on the day of the Olympic Games. It was ran early in the morning. It was ran late in the evening. It was ran over and over. The training is very private. It is very personal. But there will come a day when that which is prepared for in private is displayed in public. There is a crowd that is watching us. Don't ever forget that, that wherever you go, there is a crowd that is watching our walk with God. You know, uh, that's why we got that church van. We prayed and the Lord gave us that van. And uh, when I got it, I, I went down to the folks that do our signs and I said, uh, I need some signage for this van, but I want them on magnets where we can take it off because Brother Buddy's group takes trips in that van and I don't need the phone ringing telling me what the best life did when they was out on the town. There's a crowd watching, amen? There is a crowd and they are watching us in public and what we do in public is the result of what we have trained for in private. You've got to walk with God alone if you're going to walk with God where others can see it and know that it's true. Amen? Amen. Number two, there is the element of competition. He says in verse 5, these athletes in these games are not only viewed by a crowd of spectators, but he said they strive for mastery 
And there is the mention here of being crowned, which means to have won that event. So in order to win an event, there must be a competition against other participants. I was interested to learn that these games did not crown first, second, third place. They did not have multiple placings in these events. There was one trophy for each event. If you're not first, you're last. Everybody say amen, right? Maybe we ought to get back to that. Just, just first place and everybody else is losers. That might toughen up a whole generation. God help, we got men in the church parking lot talking about their estrogen levels and I seen one of them carrying a purse. We need to go back to first place and everybody else is losers, amen? I ain't going to call no names, J.D. Bread. I ain't going to call no names tonight. I'm not that kind of guy. Leave that on YouTube. That needs to stay. <laughs> but they only gave out a crown for first place. That was it. So literally, if you didn't get first place, it was in vain. There were no runner-ups. There was no second or third. There was no honorable mention. So there is a competition. And this competition was against other athletes. But I want to say this to us tonight. As Christians, the competition that we face is not one another. We are not in competition with one another. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say this. We're not in competition. Greater life is not in competition with any other church. We're just not. Man, if I see God blessing somebody, I say hallelujah, pour it on them, Jesus. If I see God using another church across town, hallelujah, bless the name of the Lord. God, do it to them. Give them everything you want them to have. We are not in a competition. And I don't, I don't have, you don't have to lose in order for me to win. You don't have to be down in order for me to be up. You got to get that mindset. Brother C.T. Townsend said this, and I never will forget it. He, and it stuck in my soul. He said, if you operate in a spirit of jealousy that says, if God's blessing them, it, it upsets me because that means he's not blessing me. That means you think that God is so limited that he can't bless everybody at the same time. And I got news for you. He's a big God. He can bless this church and any other church that he wants to bless. And we're not losers because they're winning. And we're not winners because they're losing. Last time I checked, there is one faith. There is one baptism. There is one God. There is one way to heaven. And I say, bless the name of the Lord. I'm not trying to be better than anybody. I'm trying to be the best we can be. The best we can be. And you have to understand that this competition and in the church, listen to me, don't let the devil pit you against other Christians. Don't let him pit you against other people in the family of God. If you're a singer and God sends a, somebody that sing and you think they're better than you, you ought to praise God. You ought to encourage them. You ought to bless them. You ought to pray for them. You ought to brag on them because God blessed them and God blessed you. This is not American Idol. Amen. And I've seen jealousy break out in churches over, over unbelievable things. You know... <laughs> You know, Baptist in the South, I mean, you can have a church split over whose banana pudding had the best meringue on top. Well, she bakes hers. Hers come out of a jello box. And next thing you know, we got women in the parking lot with their fist up. Listen, Jesus loves all the banana puddings. There's no need. Calm down, children. There's no need to put one down. They're all, they're all the blessing of God. I've seen, hadn't you seen just silliest things? People get, they feel like somehow they're in a competition. We're not in competition with one another. You know who we're in competition with? We're in competition against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every morning when you get out of bed and you put your toes on the starting block of your day, if you look down the line, you're not trying to be better than other Christians, but the world, your stinking flesh, and a devil that hates you, they're lined up beside you. And the world's out to defeat you. 
Your flesh is out to destroy you and the devil's out to kill you. And the only competition you have every day is to outrun the world, the flesh, and the devil and honor God. And if you can cross the finish line at bedtime and say, glory, the world almost had me, but I took another step. My flesh just about tripped me, but whoop, I stepped high and avoided the tackle. The devil was hot on my heels, but I ran to Jesus. If you can crawl in bed at night and have won the battles with the world, the flesh, and the devil, it matters not who is a better Christian, a greater Christian, a more polished Christian. You won the competition that day. I heard one fella wrote down this prayer. said, Lord... I've not lost my temper today. I've not cussed today. I've not gotten mad today. I haven't told anybody off today. I've not succumbed to temptation today. But here in a minute, I'm going to get out of this bed. (laughs) And then I'm going to need some help, Jesus. And that's our competition. Every day, we're lining up against this world, this flesh, and the devil. And we ought to encourage each other. Well, listen, we ought to to cheer one another on in this race. Because you're not outrunning me and I'm not outrunning you. We're all trying to outrun them. Run on, child of God. We're competing against the world, the flesh, and the devil. I want you to notice the third element. This is the element of the crown. There is a crowd that is watching. There is a competition that is lined up. But there is a crown that is to be won. Praise the Lord. Notice in our text, he says in verse 5, Yet is he not crowned. That's what they were running for. I, I will reference you. There's another beautiful passage that Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, and I, I don't want to get too bogged down in cross-referencing it, but this was an illustration Paul had used before. And he said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. He said, these athletes in these Olympic games, they will train, they will discipline themselves. They would not have three pieces of fried chicken, two rolls, and a lemon cake, say amen. But I'm I'm really going for mass more than definition. Can I get an amen? That's what I'm into, bulking, that's what I'm into. But he said, "They they don't pour their lives into these events just to finish them they do it to win that crown now watch this that crown that they would receive I studied this out this is factual the crown that those athletes would receive their first place ribbon their gold medal their trophy that crown was a half moon or it was a complete circle of a wreath made out of an olive branch. Out of an olive branch. And here's what I learned reading historically about these crowns. (laughs) This crown, if they won first place in their Olympic Games, that crown would be fresh, green, vibrant for one week, seven days. If it was dried properly it would remain intact a few months. If it was immediately taken off and hung up and never worn and kept in the right temperature and atmosphere, it would last up to a year, but if you touched it, it would begin to fall apart. And Paul said these people are living their lives for a crown that will last seven days. It will last a week. It will last a week. But he said, we're not striving to win a crown that will decay in seven days. He said, the reward of our labor 
is an eternal crown laid up for us in heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you, the things of this world really are so temporary. I, I, I cannot, I can't even tell you the, the times that I have gone to a dumpster or gone to a trash can and inside of that trash can or that dumpster there are trophies. I remember stopping at a gas station just right there on Williams Road and I was cleaning out my truck and I went over to the, the, just the little trash can there by the gas pump and I just had some bags and some bottles and when I went to put them in there there was three or four athletic trophies down in that trash can. You know, and, and when you win that trophy, you think, man, I'll have this forever. But, but when you turn 45, you know, winning regional championship in peewee football just doesn't quite have the same status with it. And something that was so impactful in that moment with time, it fades and it loses its luster and it's basically useless. It's pointless after a while. And I wonder how many things in this world People are striving for, but it's just like that crown of olive branches. Just a few days, it's faded, it's gone, it has lost its value, it has lost its worth, it has lost its appeal. And how many things have you and I poured our lives into only to find out that it was as quickly fading as an olive branch crown? But I want to encourage you. If you do what you do for the glory of God, there is a reward laid up in heaven that will last for all eternity. I believe the Lord keeps a good record of Thursday night church attendance. I believe the Lord keeps a good record of Sunday morning church attendance. I believe the Lord keeps a record of when you prayed and you didn't feel like praying, but you prayed anyway. I believe God keeps a record of when that tithe check was hard to write, but by faith you wrote it anyway. I believe God keeps a record of when all the hell in your flesh and the devil in this world was pulling on you to take a wrong move and go down the wrong path, but somehow you yielded to him and you resisted him and thank God you came out on the winning side. Heaven is keeping a record and that crown will last for all of eternity. There's so many things in this life that can capture our full attention, but yet their value is vanity. Let's lay up treasure in heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the element of the crown. Fourthly and lastly, I want you to notice in the life of the athlete as compared to the Christian, there is the element of the code. The code. He said in verse 5, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. What does that mean? It means you got to play by the rules. You got to play by the rules. In all of our lives, in our lifetime, whatever era you are from, you can think of an athlete that was on top of the world and then through some investigation or revelation found out they were cheating. And there goes their reputation and there goes their trophies and there goes their places in the record book and probably every one of us through our lifetime there was something, someone that fell from grace in the sports world because of a scandal because they weren't playing by the rules and it is that way in the life of a believer and heaven is going to reveal those violations the Bible says that some men's judgment comes now and some men's judgment comes after and sometimes it may look like somebody's winning. And they may look like they're on top of the world. But heaven will reveal if they were playing by the rules or if they were cheating in their Christian life. It's not my job. Aren't you glad that he is the referee? He is the official. He is the umpire. And he knows. And sometimes, not sometimes, all the time it's harder to play by the rules. If you could load your bat, you could hit the ball a little further. If you bend those rules, you can get instantaneous results that show up right now. But in the record book, 
And there is full disclosure that which was done corruptly will not stand. And I, I may not be hitting them over the fence, but I'd rather hit a single following the rules than hit a grand slam and have it called back for cheating. And child of God, we are not to be superstars. We're not Christians who are to have our name up in lights. We're not, we're not Christians that's trying to sell tickets and become a big name, a household name. We're just to show up and do our part and do our job and do it right. And when the whole team does it right, does it by the book, does their best, that's how championships are won. Amen. Paul said this. He said, you must play by the rules. You must strive lawfully. I'm going to say two things and I'm done. The greats always make it look easy. The greats, no matter, you pick a sport. The greats make it look easy. They make it look easy. I heard a, a comedian, I don't know who it was or I'd give him credit, but I heard him say one time that the Olympics should have a normal person in every event. <laughs> so we would know how difficult this really is, what they're doing. Because the greats make it look easy. Now think about Christians I've known down through the years who made it look so easy. They just had such faith, such trust, such joy. They followed the rules, but in following the rules, they made it look easy.